Coffee Talks. Um, they're really just like an informal online platform. Like your own personal story is just as vital, like wisdom that could be added to like this conversation. Um, but the question that I was asking was how does being like an essential worker add to the disproportionate numbers of the COVID-19 effects that we see on the black community. When you think about essential workers, those are the people who have um, high contact with other people or are exposed to like, you know, anything that's out there. And when it comes down to it, based on the socioeconomic status, you know, where we stand in terms of, you know, um, our, the poverty line and all of that, um, a lot of uh, a lot of black people ended up end up, you know, working in those uh, essential in those essential markets. I would assume that that right there gives them a higher level of exposure. Um, when it comes down to, you know, bringing that kind of exposure home, um, our homes and our houses are not that big. You know, there's a lot of people talking about, oh, if you get sick or anything, quarantine yourself in the house. But like if your house only has like one bathroom or if you only have like two bedrooms or whatever and you live in with three, four or five people, it's going to be kind of hard to uh, to keep that all in one space with all of those factors uh, in play. Have you like seen like any ways that like support like has been like allocated, not even to just like black families, but like or any like resources that like may be like available like to like black people or anybody for that matter. For those of you who don't know, um, our Alliance for Education Solutions nonprofit, we're connected to a um, national platform called Opportunity Youth United, OYU. And um, they're sending in tons and tons and tons of different resources for single parents, for students who may be displaced, foster foster youth who don't necessarily stay with their families anymore. And if any of you are interested in gaining any of those resources, please feel free to let me know in the chat box. If you don't want to let me know on the Zoom call right now, I'd be happy to forward you that information um, because it's like every single day they're sending us things from the national platform and other organizations that we're tied to um, in different states that have different um, things, different organizations in different cities. Um, I just wanted to kind of like pity back and then also add in my two cents on a couple of things that were said, especially definitely going back to the word essential. The same jobs that's available now um, to me in the instance are the same jobs that also were available before this situation. Um, and people didn't want those kind of jobs. And still to this day, they don't want those kind of jobs. But people are more trustworthy of going to these jobs that they don't want to work in than they are than to go to hospitals or go to the places that we need to necessarily go to. Um, and it's for the same reasons prior to the covert happening. It's because when we are Black, and when it comes to now with the covert mixed in with already being Black, when it comes to the media, when it comes to people speaking on it, people don't know the the truth. I, I compare it to weight loss, and people are like, oh, I, they say I'm too fat. For who? Um, um, genetics are they comparing this to? You can't take um, the European facts and apply them to the black culture. Um, is what I tell people. And when you compare the numbers to the covert. Um, um, 16, 20,000 people are, are dead from this, and half of the people that's dead are Black individuals. Um, and that's just Black individuals. But what about our community of people? Who's getting those numbers? Just like the individual who got released out of the jails and or the prisons, who were there to greet them and or make sure that they was okay or what extra funding are we getting? So it's like so many different levels that um, we missing on this uh, when we talk about this to me when it comes to speaking on this from a black perspective because we already was missing out of the loop so to definitely be missing out of another epidemic that touches us the most just like HIV and AIDS um, and the way that they're doing this we have to learn and interpret the same things that we were trying to do for HIV and AIDS and sneak and the same things that they're not trying to sneak in, which is the things that you're trying to take out. I really like the point that you made about like the media that like we're like consuming as well, because it wasn't until yesterday when I was in a webinar with Anna where um, I had learned about the equitable data collection and disclosure on COVID-19 Act. And it's pretty much to ensure that like black people who are contracting it are being accounted for correctly so that we know how to like properly like develop like solutions because if we aren't able to like identify like the problem then we can't come up like with those solutions but i'm pretty much saying that it took me having to be like in some webinar that like i was invited to like do work like i haven't heard anything about this honestly like in just 
the regular media, like for the news until then. And so I think it is really important that that's like pushed out there as well. Like when we heard the percentages in California alone, being 6% of the population and then 12% of the deaths of COVID-19, I thought that blew my mind because I didn't think it affected California as much as it affected like states in the South. And so I just thought that was crazy information. And I was like, how are we able to get this out to everyone else? I mean, and, and that's and that's one of the things that, you know, always gets us into these cycles. Well, the two parts about information, number one, like you said, the access to it, everybody's not receiving the same information. But then number two, it's like, we're also living in a time where information is hyper accessible. So like, that also creates this this problem where you feel me you have to you know fact check and like a lot of people don't even believe the information that's out there right yeah. and it's not to say and it's not to say that they're wrong for not believing that information because I, I too have times when i struggle like going through data about like you know people dying and all this stuff because i understand like most of the information that's out there is tailored for a specific reason that that misinformation also builds a divide between us because like mm -hmm. the, the people who don't believe the information may be some of the best and strongest people with the solution right but like, like if they're looking at the people who believe the information as beneath them or stupid or you know just like like gullible or any of that stuff right it creates a divide to where we cannot unify to come up with like genuine and, and, and powerful solutions so the ability to identify if something is true or false be, takes a higher priority than solving the potential problem there's a lot of things that are stopping us from you know moving forward together if that makes sense i have to totally uh, share and agree with you know, a lot of things that you said, whether it's working, education, or social circles that you are involved in, depends on where you're invited to to kind of get the information and whether it's trustworthy or not kind of information. Because I know like on, on, on Thursdays, I'm in a, a African-American um, Zoom confidential chat that is like a, a lot of top Black individuals. And one thing that I learned, you know, although we are, are are in the current present state of what is happening right now, but we have to know that this too shall pass and have to think of what's gonna be the new normal and what are we gonna do past this and focus on that. So in learning that there's a possibility, we already know, okay, kids are not going to school, but now to know that there is a possibility that even when kids do return to school, they may not never return back to school on full days and it may not be full days else schools no more um and to think of what does that look like for us as a community of people to not even know that everybody don't even have their information because we're not we're not focused on the what's next to come after this kind of situation a lot of black individuals and black families and in our black community not only like the the health but we lack education they already was trying to take that away from us then and a lot of our parents depend on children being in school as you know you know it's supposed to be education but as a source of a babysitter you know um to be able to bring in income and to bring in that so to be having jobs taken away as is now is like how do we now yeah, we're in the present, so we have to be in the present form. We can't we can't ignore where we are now. But how do we settle ourselves to think about where we're gonna go from here? What is next to come out of, after this? And how do we organize to prepare our people and make sure we're getting the word out to prepare our people for what's next to happen? My question is, is it is it important which which one is more important to establish those things and to have them set in place for when it all you know when the dust settles or is it more important to awaken people to assist in that endeavor the reason i ask is because like a lot of times i feel like when we are trying to find solutions for a problem we like to incorporate as many people as we can into that solution number one for the for the state of equality number two obviously we want our brothers and sisters to all be on the same page um and then uh, when it comes to number three like obviously the more people that you have supporting a specific idea, the more powerful it comes off or the more powerful it's initiated. But I feel like um, a lot of times we, we are exerting a lot of energy trying to convince people that they need to be on the same page. Me personally, I, I don't believe in honestly recruiting. I believe that the recruiting happens within itself. 
once you stand your ground and you stand for whatever it is that you believe in and you're going forward and you yourself is making sure that whatever you're putting out there is scholatory resource that no matter what anybody say, it was recorded and accepted as knowledgeable um, truth and fact. And just like you said, truth can't be race. It's not our job to make people get on the same page as you. Because truth can be staring people right in front of the face. It doesn't, it's not going to, it doesn't mean that they're going to believe it or not. You know, we're, we're told to wear masks and all these things. It shouldn't take for them to enforce martial law for people to want to believe the truth. It's, it's staring us right in our face that we have to put on masks. But how many people do you see out here walking around with no mask on? Nobody. Whether it's really going to protect you or not, people are going to do what it is that they want to do. So you're going to want the people and people are going to follow you if they believe in what it is that you're doing. Everybody's path to get to the same goal may not be the same. I think that in that duality of kind of deciding, like, do we want to, you know, recruit or educate folks on the importance of what's going on versus uh, working with people that are already on that same page and creating things don't necessarily have to be exclusive. Um, I think what we're seeing now is the historic distrust um, that our community holds when it comes to media um, and when it comes to the medical institution because historically we have been targeted and underserved. And so people are not really interested in really doing much other than trying their best to survive the way they know how. What I'm personally doing, I'm working on projects and things and COVID relief funds specifically for Black trans people at my organization to make sure that folks have some kind of money and also are then going to be receiving education because obviously you need to accept and acknowledge that you are in a crisis in order for you to apply to get a crisis fund. But on the other hand, I also think it's important to be kind of like in the streets or the Facebook streets, social media streets, trying to educate with people. And um, that may turn into arguments and it may get heated at certain points, but I think it is necessary because we know that our community is not really tuning into the news like that. And if our community is tuning into the news, they are being fear-mongered and further traumatized. And so they often just shut down and don't want to do anything. So if anyone is going to be able to be moved and to feel comfortable and safe listening to information, it's going to have to be from other Black people. Want to kind of note, too, that we have to be careful when we do that because we can be emulating the same behaviors that white supremacy has imposed on us by thinking that we know best for, you know, our community or a community in general and acting before speaking or coming together um, in a more cohesive village mindset. So we have to also be able to self-check ourselves through this process. I think earlier it was asked, like, how has media contributed to the pandemic? And I ultimately think that media has been helpful in terms of, and I say this kind of like tongue in cheek, helpful in, in the ways of that it illuminates how convoluted our government is and how we all really aren't on the same page because we are literally seeing medical professionals and doctors who essentially are in a position of whistleblowing because they're not being supported by their hospitals that they're working at and they're not being supported by the federal government. And when people are seeing that, that creates in turn more distrust, but it also I guess for me, it makes me feel comfortable because as a Black person, I already knew what was going on with the systems. And so it's affirming because now everyone is getting to see exactly how it is to be in a system where you're promised security, where you're, where you're promised wellness, where you have gone through the hoops and maybe got a job. So now that you have a job, you can find a tough life insurance. And to be seeing all of that swept away, absolutely. I think in turn, it's hopeful in terms of the future that this is so big right now that we are gonna be able to implement changes that are longstanding. And this has changed the economic 
structure so much that it's impacted everything. Even education and college itself is going to look different for folks. Um, and also kind of the value of getting a college education and essentially how we mark what upward mobility even looks like. And so I think there's a lot of unknowns, but I don't think that's necessarily a negative thing. I think that's something that we can twist and flip. And it's something that we've always done because at the beginning of this country's inception, they were counting on us to build this country. And now that this country is collapsing, they're again going to be depending on us to clean it up because we see these white leaders and these folks who are getting the overrepresentation in the media over these problems and they are not helping. And a lot of them are turning this into a political and personal thing instead of addressing the communities that are the most impacted, like our community and finding solutions. So we know that at the end of the day, when it comes to the solutions, it's gonna be on our backs and we're gonna be able to own that simultaneously. That's, that's the reason I asked the question. It's, it's really hard for us to unify as a black community, obviously, because all of us are different. All of us have different walks of life. All of us, you know, view things differently. Um, and a lot of times those clashes, you know, can um, hinder our progress. So I just wanted to, I just kind of wanted to like, you know, check in and see what people thought about it. Because, you know, the one thing that is also a repeating cycle in all of these different, you know, pandemics, epidemics, and, you know, different forms of genocide for our race one way or another, is that we're never on the same page, right? Like we're never, we can't, and it's not to say that that's easy. I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying that, you know, there is a solution for us to be on the same page, but like, that's just a worry on my end because like when it comes down to it, if we're supposed to be finding a solution, we're supposed to be working together. Um, once, if you got people who don't agree with that solution, now y'all bumping heads about things, you feel me, that, that don't really matter. Like, you know, I've, I've, I've literally watched people go from, yeah, we're supporting each other to each other's organization. They have one disagreement and now everything falls out of line because people put that much stake and that much, you know, energy into those solutions. So I just wanted to, you know, pick people brains on that, on that accord. Cause like, I feel like we're running into a similar issue now where everybody's kind of in the moment right now. Everybody's like feeling the pressure of what's happening. But like you said, um, at the end of the day, you feel me, we're running up in a place where we have to figure out a solution and have to think about the tomorrow once all of this is said and done. But like, I, I like I said, I, I don't just, I just wonder how much time that we need to spend, like making sure we're all on the same page versus like, you know, planning to get it done so thank you for exactly. thank you for that response i really appreciate that for real i was just gonna piggyback off of what i also kind of was talking about aaron we when we were on the webinar yesterday and we heard from congresswoman barbara lee oh my god she pretty much said every single thing that you said i was Tunde. so i was like listening to you talk and i kind of saw the similarities between the two and i was taking notes yesterday on the webinar and this is what she said i want to share it with you and see tell me tell me that tell me that you don't see these similarities so her last words of encouragement when she had logged off of the call was that to, she was talking to everyone on the call and she was pretty much telling everyone to remember our ancestors in the middle passage and just to survive and that we shall co we shall overcome and we still shall rise as Maya Angelou says and that nobody told us the road would be easy and this is a moment our ancestors are counting on us and to always think back to um, all of the African Americans that had died in the middle passage in slavery and Jim Crow um, because right now is one of the most critical times in history that we're going to look back and see how resilient um, our people are and see how we can move forward from this pandemic because that's really what it is exactly what you had just stated exactly what Rex had just stated it's like how are we going to move forward in this pandemic and how are we going to get back to the new normal thing so I just kind of wanted to give you some kudos to you um, for sharing what you had shared and thank you brother Rex for um, posing the question for everyone to hear um, appreciate yeah. the both of you I think another aspect too, and this is more so from my personal politics and my standpoints, I've done a lot of advocacy and I still do a lot of advocacy, um, specifically centering black people because obviously I'm a black person. Um, but what I have found is sometimes when going to support all you automatically erase the people who need the most. And so what I mean by that is we are very aware that in our community, which is not exclusive just to the Black community, but in our community, there is a divide between queer or gay people and straight Black people. And when it comes down to resources and allocation, Black folk get the least, but those who are queer or trans get the least of the least, if anything. 
I think it's important for us to be able to name that and acknowledge that and continually be loud about that. Because when it comes to the work that I do, I found my myself getting kind of almost fatigued. Uh, for context, I was previously in Black Lives Matter Sacramento for three years. In that time, I felt that I personally got a lot of support just because of the type of person I am and the social capital that I possess. But I know that people treat me the way they treat me because I'm Ayotunde, not because I'm a Black queer person, and they won't treat other Black queer people the way that they treat me or regard me. And that's a problem. From a sociological standpoint, when it comes to folks being stratified and us being at the bottom, we know that when you help the folks who are at the absolute bottom, that anything you do for those people will benefit the rest of the folks who are more privileged than them even if that privilege is arguably minuscule to some people. So I think reaching out to other folks and trying to find a common ground is going to be important, but also recognizing where we think we fit best and making sure that folks are actually covered. Because it is so frustrating to me when people are up on this like we're all Black rhetoric and we need to fight for all Black people, which is an objective truth, but in reality, it hasn't played out like that. And when we look at the civil rights era and we look at today, a lot of those activists who were queer during that time have been disregarded and not given the proper respect. And that translates into the disparities that we were going through pre-COVID-19 in terms of Black people, just Black queer people, just not getting what they need. And then when asking for are persecuted by our own community. And so for me personally, I think folks just need to figure out where they fit because my time and my energy is only spent on Black queer people like period when it comes to my activism and things of that nature, I will address the nuance of things that affect all Black people, but there needs to be an intentional and loud focus on Black trans women, on Black people, you know, across the spectrum. We are impacted in such a way that we fall at the bottom of every category when it comes to employment discrimination, when it comes to housing, literally everything we, we need resources for. And so when we're in a pandemic like this, we are going to be the first ones to die and the first ones to be forgotten. And I do have issues with comparing this pandemic to the AIDS pandemic, but I will say one thing that we can use from the AIDS pandemic um, in terms of like learning from it is that when folks were dying, it was easier for society to condemn them in order to involve themselves with whatever feelings they had. And I feel like that may be something that happens during this time. And so we need to recognize what happened in the past so it doesn't reoccur. So I feel as a Black queer person, I've always been told that I need to wait my turn when it comes to getting acceptance from inner community. And no one should have to be waiting their turn. That should be an instant thing, and it's not. And it's been a conversation that's been happening since the civil rights era and even before that, and we're still not where we need to be. And so that's another layer that we need to address during pandemics like this that are affecting our community because there are still people who are going to be forgotten. And it's not just Black men and women. Um, we also tend to stick to like this binary way of thinking of how Black men and women and individuals operate and work and what they're going through instead of really deconstructing the fact that you know we are not a monolith but we do have shared experiences so it's thank only, you sharing you better preach that was very very well said we were there and i um, agree um but also in saying what you said you said we need to come together and i feel like when we start separating we start off saying black 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 but then when we go to saying Black and LBGTQ, um, then we start breaking down the L, the B, the G, the T, and the Qs. And then we then now separate the Blackness of the L, the B, the G, and then the Q of all of that and forget, forget about everything else. And in that, even in our community, first starting off with the Blackness, we need the women and the women consist of the cisgendered women as well as the trans women. We need the men, the cisgendered men, as well as the trans men. So 
we need not to divide and, and break things up and in between if our goal is to really work as one. We have to understand their struggles. And just like you, you stated in the beginning earlier, like certain arguments and, and certain things that we don't talk about need to be talked about and certain people need to be brought in our settings most time like i feel like as a community of individuals and i just don't ever always speak from an intersex point or a trans point or a a black man's trans point like i'm also a a surviving incarcerated individual like i speak from some i'm also a single father like i speak from so many different aspects as a black human being so to um to specialize or signal out one part of me I feel like it takes away from other parts of me and not just of me, but also of the community. And we can get so lost um, in that when we're trying to also marginalize ourselves and we end up doing to ourselves what we're saying that others are doing to us. Um, then we start within interpreting and marginalizing and then re-internalizing the same things within our own community that other communities are then doing to us and we're not involving other communities because of what our fears and our our things is or because we feel like they don't understand or they they shouldn't be a part of this community but at the end of the day when we start off as being black we are all the same community whether we accept being black or not period is all and although we are in the same community we don't all think the same and you're right we we haven't all came from the same perspective as i stated before so not everybody has the same perspective and that's basically what any and everything is based off of that we does is a person's perspective for that moment of survival at the end of the day um so i just want to say that i think what we're kind of touching on is the intersectionalism of like you know our own standpoints you know what i'm saying like the things that make us who we are obviously dictate you know how we maneuver in our communities, how we maneuver with other communities and all that, all that. And, and me personally, I think when it comes down to it, I feel like all generalizations are false. Whenever you talk about, you know, any community with the broad brush, I feel like you're always going to have not only exceptions, but like literally margins to that brush. Cause there are people like you feel me who, who either don't identify or are not given the same, the same schedule of privileges that other people are given based on what that brush stroke looks like. So I definitely agree. I think there's a, there's an importance for having uh, black queer organizations, black queer, you know, groups that to, to vocalize that for other people who don't identify with the queer aspect of like their identity. I think uh, whenever it comes down to it, you know, personal, political stuff like that, like, I feel like the best people to fight for a specific issue are those people and uh, for everyone else to fight with them, like to ally behind them and, and, you know, just to make sure that, you know, everyone's being treated as equally as possible. But like, I definitely, I definitely agree with both of you. I feel like there's an importance to making sure that we understand that everyone isn't treated the same. Just because we are a black community doesn't mean that black community is all one thing. Y'all are changing people's lives right now and don't even know it. You know what I'm saying? Just keep up with the good work. I jumped in a little late. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. I hear you. Hi, my name is Dwayne. I'm calling from Detroit. I'm really enjoying the uh, program. It's cool that you guys do this. You know, one thing that happened out of um, this, this pandemic situation is that there's been a lot of um, Zoom and web uh, web uh, rallies and town <laughs> halls and meetings, you know. So just going off like one of those ideas, um, I, I agree. I feel like Zoom has been one of the positive things of everything that I see going on is that we're able to come together, right, and eliminate, you know, some of the barriers that would have prevented us before. I just wanted to share how awesome it is that we can have these conversations and feel like as a community we're coming together when otherwise it may have been more difficult to do so. I just wanted to chime in chime in and highlight um, some of the things that Ayo Tunde was saying and how that like resonates with me. I think um, the people on the margins, like they're not even like seen, they're not looked for. We think about, you know, black moms and black dads, but we don't think about um, the homeless trans woman like on the street and getting them services um, like Iotunde was saying, like they have to acknowledge first that they're in a crisis and that um, you know they need um, help. But who's going out and doing that outreach to them? I don't even think you know there's really that you know outreach. And also, like when we hear stories of death in the Black community from this coronavirus, I think there's you know even more numbers that haven't been recognized or acknowledged because they're just like. 
there might be a fear to go to the hospital and get support because they already face discrimination um, for who they are. I think, yeah, just the numbers can already be skewed in that um, respect. I believe in um, uplifting those that are at the very bottom because we're going to lift up everybody else if we if we start with those that are just always left behind. I feel like I am like one of like those people that are like very like marginalized, like being like at the bottom. Like I don't really have like family like support like that. And so being able to just um, be a part of like this discussion and like hear like the wisdom from like all of you, like it's really like motivating because me not always like knowing the answers, like that scares me. And like, I guess a lot of the times, like I feel like I don't have like that face like within myself, but like after listening to like everybody talk, like I feel like it's at least like giving me like that much more hope. So like I said, I'm just like thankful that you guys have like all like been here and like um, just like contributed like to this space. So I really appreciate all of you guys. And we appreciate you too, Aaron. Just remember, you always have a lot to bring to this space too. You know what I mean? We learn, we learn just as much from you as you learn from us every time. Going echoing what uh, Aaron said about you know kind of the complications and the difficulty of navigating the unknown. Um, one tool I use for my own mental health um, is reframing things. Um, I wouldn't quite call myself an optimist, but I wouldn't call myself a pessimist either, but that may be because I just don't like binaries. <laughs> um, but I think that when it comes to navigating the unknown, I think that's sort of natural to us um, as Black people and as marginalized people. We pretty much never know what's going to come next, but we do know that it's going to impact us the hardest no matter what, um, and that we are going to be able to find a way to navigate through that. And so sometimes the unknown is doubly scary, but it is also offering hope because it is showing that there isn't an absolute and that there is something that we don't know, which means that we do have influence and power somewhere to create what is going to exist kind of like in our reality. We're going to be able to manifest from something that's unknown to known. And even if what's known um, is also harmful to us, we're going to be able to then have more information, more insight to deal with that disposition. I didn't know that you didn't have. Um, family support. And that's one thing that I do talk about often is that that's a privilege that I have as a Black person. I do have familiar support. Um, I had to work for that support, um, but I do have it. And that's something I don't have to worry about, um, as well as other privileges that I occupy, like being housed. Being unhoused is something that I will never have to really worry about. Um, and I say that from a very humble standpoint, because I have so much support that even if something happened to me with my family, I have so much community that I would never be on the street. And that's not an option for many people. So that's super important for us to kind of, for me, especially to note and speak on and then do my part helping those people who don't have that security. Um, and I will end with saying that we are in the same city and I have wanted to connect more. And I think after this, we'll be able to connect. And I definitely consider you part of my chosen family. And I do not stratify between blood family and chosen family. I treat all family the same. Definitely love you and love everyone who has been on here and has shared Yes, and I do just want to say that um, our organization is really heavily based on sharing your story. And so just the fact that you all went straight into like being vulnerable and being so willing to share with us who you are to the core and what you believe in is really, really um, powerful. And I just want to thank every single one of you for being part of this call today. We will have more similar calls to this, sharing resources with each other and just being able to connect on this level like we did today. I just wanted to note that earlier I did mention that my organization um, other organizations are working on COVID relief funds specifically to the Black queer community and marginalized queer communities. Um, and that is under development right now. I do have some meetings to finalize kind of what that looks like because we want to have everything together before we launch. Um, but when that is together, I will share that um, in the space. I want to have time to be on a future call as well as send out emails to folks. So, you know, by the time this is up or for folks who are following, they'll be able to access that. Um, if they are local to uh, Sacramento community and fall into those intersections. Um, kind of just similar to um, what they just said. Um, if you're in the Bay Area, whether you're in Oakland, San Francisco, 
Um, I do, for those who didn't know, I work at the Oakland LBGTQ Community Center. And we now have housing incentives for people in the community. Um, and it has nothing to do with covert. We were getting it before then. Um, so definitely if you was in a situation even before this covert hit and you need help paying your rent, even if you are in a roommate situation where you're renting a room from somebody or anything, or if y'all know anybody, um, you can send them my way so that I can start the process with them and get them on a wait list and pre-qualified to know if they can get approved or not. But um, that is a form of resources. And we also do give out hygiene and food as well during this time. And my organization nice. as well gives out gift cards and um, cash out people if they need help with food or gas or anything. So I just wanted to um, make sure that people nice. didn't know that um, that's part of resource. I am a resource too as well. Okay, thank you for sharing that as well. Um, I will definitely send that out to some of our Bay Area folks that we know of. Thank y'all for being a part of this call. I really do appreciate it, along with the rest of the AES team. Um, we hope to see y'all next Friday, if possible. Right. Please feel free to join us. Um, I'll send out those emails. Please look out for them. And just take care, everyone. So wash your hands. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, y'all. Peace. Thanks Bye. for joining us.